the first killer applications of blockchain. You can have a white paper and a Bitcoin address, and people will send it. People would try to buy and invest in ICOs for the expectation of a high return. Can they get it? Go to attack. That makes me sad. This new promising technology is is just being abused by greed. We have a lot of work to do as an industry. Uh,一般说到我名字的时候，你如果说徐子敬或者 Ryan 这个世界是很糟糕的所以在基督教的神学里面有一个问题其实很难回答就是如果上帝是全知全能的他为什么创造出了这么一个糟糕的痛苦的充满了缺陷的世界他是个变态吗有一个人和我这么说零八零九年的全球金融危机，然后各国政府都在拼命的印钞，全球的货币系统是有问题的。在没有比特币之前，我觉得我是一个赞成金本位的这么样一种思维。当我第一次看见他，并且并且做了一些研究之后，我觉得
您是哪年第一次听说比特币？二零一一年，这个东西就是我曾经做梦梦到过的事物一样。我在了解到 Bitcoin 的一两天之内，我就把自己所有的积蓄都投进去买了 Bitcoin， 平均成本当时大约是，呃，十美金左右吧，啊，会有好几千个。That's my desk.、Uh, this is the this is the main conference room. I was working at Walmart、uh, doing e-commerce in China. I heard, first heard about Bitcoin、uh, through my brother Charlie Lee.、Uh, that was in, I think, it was in early 2011, in the earlier spring of 2011. I was a software engineer at Google. I played around with some GPU miners. I bought、um, some used GPUs and new ones. I had like two machines with like eight、uh, GPUs in them. It was very noisy, very hot, and it was fun though. We were doing the mining、um, of Bitcoin in the summer of 2011. So he was doing it on his part in California. I was doing it over here in Shanghai, in my apartment. 那个时候实际上我在做另外一家公司，是另外一个行业的，是做互联网广告、互联网营销。I worked in Goldman Sachs for eleven half years. I was a partner there. I had a phone call from a friend who asked me about it, and I went online and googled Bitcoin. I bought it. Yeah, <laughs> I bought a lot. UNICEF, as an organization, works in 135 countries around the world, and has more than 12,000 staff who are dedicated to solving problems for children. And these are problems of education, access to information, and healthcare,、um, and how people deal with the world after an emergency. So our first impression was that this could help UNICEF、uh, and and help our team in the work that we do. Walking into the blockchain ecosystem, we'll have to go back to where it all started: Bitcoin. In the early years of Bitcoin, a small group of people discovered its appeal. They've gradually given Bitcoin its value through mining and purchasing, and some of them weren't thinking beyond that. They were wondering what could they do with Bitcoin or even the technology behind blockchain. You 是怎么拿到你第一桶金的？呃，最早期的应该还是挖出来的比特币的增值。你最多的时候挖了多少币？最最早期的时候？上万的比特币吧。那那时候炒币炒的成功吗？我觉得不成功。我觉得在数字货币行业里面，有一个是永远赚不到钱的，那就是炒币。我从来没看见一个人在数字货币行业靠炒币能赚到钱的。也许他现在短期是赚钱的，但是时间再拉长，一定是亏钱的。你当时亏了多少钱？我印象当中，当时也亏的并不多，几百万人民币吧。就赚钱对我来说兴趣不大，但我很愿意去尝试那些没有做过的事情。就比如说怎么赚钱呢？不太是学金融的。第二年的时候接触到挖矿，不得不提到有一个网站叫 g o b s e com， 那就意思是说 Global Bitcoin Stock Exchange， 呃，一些 Enterprise 就可以到这个网站上去发售自己的股票，融资融 Bitcoin。而当时那个网站上所有的这些企业呢，其实大部分都是做挖矿的。那么因为挖矿呢，它是一个。这个现金流特别恒定的活动，它会每天都分红。那么其实你可以对未来的这现金流来进行预测。那么这非常像是一种债券了。这个对于学金融来讲，就觉得这应该是一个很有意思的一个市场。The the original version of Bitcoin called for CPU mining so that anybody could join in and do it. But as with any industry where there's money to be made, there's constant innovation. It moved on from CPUs. To graphics processing units, a GPU is actually basically like a mini computer. It has its own processor, its own memory, and all being integrated onto one card, it can process much faster than a standard CPU. CPU 的挖矿也盛行了一段时间，后来呢又有 FPGA。FPGA 呢和 GPU 呢其实是有一个 trade off， 就是 GPU 呢它是更便宜的能够获得算力，但是它的功耗非常的高。但 FPGA 呢你需要预先花很多钱去投资。但之后呢，功耗呢较低，噪声也较低。呃，那么 GPU 和 FPGA 进并存的时代呢，但并不长，大概也就一年多时间。啊、呃，那么之后 ASIC 也就出现。The Bitcoin market now is dominated by ASICs. That's an application-specific integrated circuit. Basically, these processing chips are built to only do one thing. All it is made to do is process. The algorithm for Bitcoin, so they are they are able to take hundreds of these chips and put them in one machine, and the the speed is is exponentially greater than any other method. 
The first company that created an ASIC for Bitcoin is uh, Canon Creative. They make the Avalon series of miners. Um, they, they produced the first and it's snowballed from there. In the Cat. Kamal,那么他有在网上跟我交流，他提到实际上可以自己来做一些个芯片来挖矿。那么其实经过简单的计算呢，这个应该是一个利润非常高的一个活动了。但当时他融的钱虽然非常少，但是也没有太多投资人
Well, this is your last name's initial <laughs> as well. <laughs> I was playing around with the Bitcoin source code mm -hmm. and decided to, um, to kind of create my own coin. It was mostly for fun. The other reason is before Litecoin, there were about a dozen other coins. Let's see, there's a coin called Xcoin, there's a coin called Solidcoin, Iocoin. There were a few, but most of them were, were pre-mined. So the creators of the coin kind of wanted to get rich. So they mine a lot of coins for themselves before they release it. Mm -hmm. And then if, that, if their coin becomes popular, then the coins that they held would be worth more. So I, I created Litecoin to try to make a coin that's more fair. Mm -hmm. So I didn't pre-mine any for myself. I made the mining very fair mm -hmm. and kind of released the source code before the binary so people had a chance to kind of play around with the mining before the actual coin was released. There we go, yeah, Litecoin. So we will have a, a QR code. QR code, 0.088 okay. wow. Litecoin. Yeah. So pull up my mobile wallet. Litecoin would be cheaper and it, would be, it will cost less to, to use. So transaction fees will be lower. I see Bitcoin and Litecoin being used um, together where Bitcoin would be used for purchases of larger amounts and Litecoin for smaller amounts. I never saw Litecoin as replacing Bitcoin, but I wanted to kind of help um, Bitcoin succeed. And I saw that as one of the kind of the bottlenecks of Bitcoin getting achieving mass adoption. And Coinbase was one of the few companies that was making Bitcoin easy to use, Bitcoin easy to, to buy Bitcoin, easy to spend it, uh, so I wanted to help in that aspect. When I decided to join Coinbase, Bobby, and he wanted to start a company in China to do um, Bitcoin exchange. And he actually wanted to hire me to go to China. But I, got, I decided to kind of stay in the U.S. and focus on, on Coinbase, kind of do something separate from him. I started buying some Bitcoins in early 2013 uh, on a site called btcchina.com. So that was a site recommended by my brother. Say, hey, there's a site website you can buy Bitcoin. Like, oh, okay, let me go check it out. And so it turns out they had start, already started the website since 2011。我在2011年的时候，听我的朋友黄笑宇，他当时在QQ上，他签了一个名，他说，嗯，想玩Bitcoin的联系我啊，就我就问他了，我说，Bitcoin是什么？啊，他说是一种数字货币。然后那我说有什么可以做的吗他说可以日本那边有一个交易所不错但是中国还没有我说那好啊那我们做一个交易所我说我问他你可以做吗他可以然后我们就用一个月的时间就把这个交易所给他做好了做好了然后就推出来了
就开始有大量的用户进来啊，当时那个平台的交易量就开始就是呃就非常的活跃这样子啊，然后我们就开始有这个资本进来。The birth of Bitcoin carries the ideal of and belief in equality and freedom, but its crazy growth at an early age reduced it to becoming something driven by greed and lust. Bitcoin's price hit one thousand dollars in 2014. Trading volume also increased by 50 percent compared with the previous year. But just at this moment, a winter came. I记得非常清楚，就是有一年就比特币跌到最低谷的时候，呃，当时我们挖矿，其实挖矿都变成了根本就不赚钱。我开完矿机，每天挖的比特币都不够付电费。就当时大家真的是非常绝望，人民币的
破产的、关门的这种团队啊、公司一大堆，啊，当时那块儿 B 圈，我们其实圈里面比较活跃的很多老朋友，后来都黯然退场。This crypto winter from 2013 to 2014 once caused the entire blockchain industry to fall into a trough. Many people who once found ideals in Bitcoin had to leave with despair. After this winter, the ones who stayed behind, however, slowly established the industry's ecosystem. Opportunities started to make themselves apparent, as well as challenges and difficulties. 这边就是一个 blockchain center， 没错，目前我们这个 blockchain center 在全球已经开了得有十几个了。我们想做一个全世界第一家 IPO 上市的比特币公司，但实际上当时我们做 IPO 的时候还是太早，就监管机构和证交所还是认为这个商业模式风险太高了。这个过程持续了两三年。为什么会那么长时间？因为递交，然后被打回来，再递交，再打回来，来来回回，可能数不清了吧。当时还有一点，他们不认可，我我记得非常清楚，就当时他们认为比特币的价格永远到不了八百澳币，那是四千人民币。一四年，他们做出了这么样一个判断。是你是怎么熬过来的？一四年那个时候，欠款都，就是这个供货商的款也还不上了。嗯，就运气好呗，行情恢复了。嗯。就整个业界，其实你看到现在，基本上都是做矿机各个竞争对手，他们做的形态呢，就大体是如此。那么基本上都是我们的第一代矿机这个形态的这个延续。During the crypto winter, the Butterfly Labs was prosecuted by the FTC. Fried Cat disappeared. Another industry giant, KNC Miner, went bankrupt. Only Bitmain kept releasing new miners successively. When the warmth returned, Bitmain's miners almost became the only option on the market at the time. Bitcoin, it is actually a high competition industry. Every miner is looking for the highest return. When they get the highest return, they hope to get the highest energy consumption. This is a competitive process in the fight. 啊，越先进的这个制程呢，它就能够越好的去降低成本、降低功耗。其实，在二零一三年到二零一五年之间呢，整个行业呢，他们都在同时追求两件事情。第一件事情呢是，呃，做最先进工艺；第二件事情呢是对芯片进行全定制的这个设计。那么 ，Bitman 它的整个我们的创业团队呢，其实一开始我们是不会做全定制设计的，因为 Full Custom Design 这种技术呢，它是集成电路最古老的技术。等到中国的集成电路业界开始做这个半导体设计的时候呢，呃，是很少有人会做全定制设计的。那么，我们整个的团队呢，也经过了两年多的时间去整合有关的这个技术，去学习，然后去把它。呃，整合到我们的设计流程当中来，去真正的去获得这种技术。我们的功耗是最好的，啊，我们的成本在当时又是绝对于领先于对手的。那么到了一五年秋天的时候，十月份，啊，我们推出了我们 S 七的那一代矿机，那一代矿机应该是奠定了我们在整个行业绝对的这个领先地位。听说好像现在我看到有人写啊报道说，每十台挖矿机呢就有一台是来自于比特大陆的、嗯。没有，有十台挖矿机可能能只有一台不是比特大陆的。哦，对对对，<笑>为什么一直就没有竞争对手，或者说没有一个可以较量的这么一个人？在集成电路的任何一个细分领域里面，我们发现多多少少都会出现这样的一个现象，呃，因为这其实是一个规模效应非常明显的领域，就是当规模越大。我们就能够在投入更多的研发资源，我们就能够在每一个细节上面去做的比竞争者更好。呃，规模效应确实是在半导体领域里面非常突出的一个现象。这也是为什么我们看得到在半导体的很多细分领域，你去看，几乎都是老大吃肉，老二喝汤，然后老三就不存在了。In 2017. 
Bitmain's annual turnover reached approximately $2.5 billion, making it the second largest integrated circuit design company in mainland China. Meanwhile, in the second half of 2017, Bitmain also became one of the top five global customers of TSMC, the world's largest dedicated semiconductor foundry. Some people joke that, regarding the commercial contribution to the semiconductor industry, artificial intelligence speaks loudly, yet still is no match for Bitcoin. In the technology business, for short periods of time, there can be one company that really takes a dominant role because they figure out a problem in a slightly more effective way than all of their competitors do. They got a small advantage in the race, but the compounding period of that small advantage, maybe it's a 2% advantage, but if you compound that you know, monthly, or if you compound that every couple of weeks, they outpace their competition very rapidly. And you can see it now in the hardware business now with Bitmain because they designed a 28 nanometer and then a 16 nanometer ASIC chip for Bitcoin mining that were a little bit, a decent amount, but not a huge amount better in terms of power efficiency than their competitors. And because of that like slight advantages. advantage in their stride, 如果非要我说的话，成功的原因，我觉得可能是因为运气。在我们当时最早挖矿的时候，比特大陆并不大，就在行业可能并不是前三的这样的公司，就我们也并没有想到它能做的这么，就能做的这么好。由于它的它的几个商业决策，我觉得是成功的，并且抓住了很很重要的历史机遇。就第一个是烤毛公司的解体，然后比特大陆它有它从那边吸收了很多优秀的员工，还有一件事就是当时整个行业的不景气，导致于真的掏钱买机器的人并不多，然后他们做了一个很好的选择，就是和那些水电站厂长们进行联合挖矿，就你出电我出机器，然后挖出来的币我们对半分，对。这使得就是他们在熊市当中活下来了，所以牛市当中爆发了。而同时，一批很优秀的企业在熊市当中就没有，就扛得过去，就他们都倒闭了。更重要一个因素就是第三是我们中国大陆市场非常的庞大，我们有庞大人口基数，这是一个概率的游戏啊。如果你乘以一个很小的一个比例，那我们这个矿工群体都很大，这第一。第二个，中国过去的几年的基建投资非常成功，所以我们有非常非常快捷的这个制造体系，我们有非常便宜的这个电力电力系统。就导致整个中国的矿工，你可以看到今天持有的算力已经超过整个全网算力的百分之八十，所以说背靠这么一个市场，那必然会成功，中间一定会有一些企业跑出来。所以我们看就是比特大的这个在矿机市场上，它的份额是超过了百分之五十以上。去年的时候，嗯，比特大陆的营收就达到了二十五亿美元，已经，呃，利润可能和英伟达差不多了。是什么原因可以如此快速的增长？呃，首先我觉得还是要客观的认识到我们公司的成长呢，它是整个呃 blockchain 这个行业成长的缘故啊。嗯、呃，因为我们卖的是挖矿机嘛，那么如果说这个币价上涨，那么显然我们挖出来的币就越值钱，矿工呢就越愿意投入到挖矿的这种活动当中。因此，这种呃行业本身呢，它其实对我们的这个驱动、这种啊、呃、推动的这个作用应该是最大的。嗯。哎，那像英伟达这种，其实也在芯片行业也是一个巨头，他现在也在盯着这一块。你担心他的进入和竞争吗？其实本身我倒不是很担心，因为在任何一个细分领域，呃，今天电路它都是需要长时间的这种积累的。呃 ，NVIDIA 它的体量很庞大，但是它即便进入到这个领域的话，它也需要同样的时间周期去积累有关的这个技术。但是在这期间的话，我们又进步了。那么，而且这个领域的竞争优势呢，又特别的这个明显，啊，那么同时呢，这在一个企业内部呢，他如果说分心去做一件和他主营业无关的事情，这个其实也会动摇他公司的这个企业文化和方方面面，呃，管理上的挑战也会随之而来啊，呃，所以我倒不是很担心这个问题。
现在交易所啊，我我好像听别人说，现在有七千家全球各各种各样的这个交易所，为什么会这么快出现了几千家的交易所？这就是技术。技术发展的先进性啊，那么我们看到你在二零零零年啊，互联网快速发展的时候，那么也是出现了这个不是几千家，是几十万家互联网，那时候叫 dot com 公司啊 ，dot com 公司，现在所有公司都是 dot com 公司啊，对吧？那么这个 blockchain 作为这样一种技术。那么它开始被越来越多的人接受。我觉得，当我们过十年以后，我们再去再去回头看现在的时代，我们会觉得现在其实是人类很伟大的这个时代。那么，这全球几千个从业人员，他们用自己的智慧啊，用自己的这个青春，甚至还冒着各种各样的风险，让这个产业得到了快速发展。Crypto exchange is also one of the earliest industries in blockchain. In addition to facing the same turbulent waves of price fluctuations, the exchange has to worry about its own security issues. In February, the world's first and then largest Bitcoin exchange, Mt. Gox, was hacked. 850,000 bitcoins were missing or stolen, valued at more than 450 million dollars at the time. It was considered the trigger to the later industry winter. Even that particular winter passed. This exchange industry nightmare has never faded away. Which area is the the weakness? Bitcoin, the network is is safe, but companies like Coinbase, they're a custodial service, right? So they hold bitcoins for for their customers. Yeah. So if you kind of break into Coinbase's vault, so to speak, you can steal the bitcoins. People don't understand is once you have freedom of money, you have control of your own money, then you have to protect it yourselves. One of the best ways to keep coins yourself is to use something like a hardware wallet. It's called wallet and it keeps it off of your computer. 区块链以及基于区块链上数字资产，比如比特币啊、以太坊啊，都是他们啊这个呃安全分为几个层次。那么第一个呢是它网络的安全。啊，那么因为你比比特币和以太坊的区块链分散在全世界啊，互联网的很多个节点，它的数据的备份可能有啊几万份、几十万份，那这显然它是一个更安全的网络。那么另外一个安全呢，它可能是在消费者啊，那么消费者的这个你在使用比特币的时候，你如何能够保存好你的密码啊？尤其是现在有很多这样的病毒和木马的情况下，你能不不让你的密码被偷到？那么是消费者安全。第三个呢是企业级安全。那么，作为你服务很多消费者，你可能存储了更多的这个数字资产，你如何保证它的安全？那么，所以安全其实有很很多人一味的说啊，比特币很安全，它比银行更安全，或者说比特币不安全，你看它出现了某家公司啊 ，MT Gox 被黑了，那么其实都是不对的。其实我们还是不断听到有交易所被被盗，比如说日本的、韩国的，今年啊，那你觉得整个行业在这个问题上做的到底好不好？呃，我觉得是因为我刚刚讲，就是说企业级安全的技术其实还还还在不断的发展。那么很多新兴的交易所，它可能这个基于没有经验啊，也许是啊其他原因啊，所以就出现了这些故障，这个也是呃难以避免的。但我相信，随着这个这个行业的发展，随着这各种安全标准的建立，那么它是技术是能够保证数字资产的绝对的安全的。Before I joined Coinbase, I talked to the founder Brian. Um, and I asked him, like, what's the worst that can happen? And he told me, like, the worst is if the coins got stolen, right? And that's like a company-ending event, and that's kind of something that we focus really hard to prevent. We spend a lot of effort and and money on hiring and building out like good security practices and a good security team、mm -hmm. to focus on that. Did anyone try to hack? We've had issues with people. Like trying to attack Coinbase, whether it's like a DDoS attack or、um, like a phishing attack,、um, we definitely got a lot of attacks. I mean, Coinbase was a was a huge target. According to statistics, there have been 56 attacks on cryptocurrency exchanges around the world since 2011, bringing the total loss to 1.63 billion dollars. In January 2018. Japan's second-largest cryptocurrency exchange, CoinCheck, was attacked by hackers, causing the exchange to lose 534 million dollars in digital tokens. It became the biggest theft in cryptocurrency history so far. However, 
Three months later, CoinCheck's almost bankruptcy fate was changed by a $34 million acquisition deal with Japan's third largest online brokerage, Monex. Well, we started uh, studying, uh, we actually like uh, already two or three years ago. You say uh, experimented the, the technology of a uh, blockchain. Then, so, so we kind of have a familiarity to the blockchain. And also starting about uh, one and a half years ago, it was October last year, we uh, officially announced we would be in the crypto business. Why were you interested in hacked um, exchanges? Crypto business is really the one of the biggest applications of blockchain as of right now. Okay? So it's very important to have a crypto exchange in, in a sense, not only as a you know, money-making business, but also to be a part of the blockchain kind of uh, you know, scene. It's very important. The coin check uh, got unfortunately hacked, but they have engineers. They have uh, uh, close to two million customer base. Uh, it's you know so it's uh, it's a, it's a great property, mm. uh, but they needed some uh, uh, help as regard to you know, inter you know enhancing internal controls, uh, enhancing the uh, cyber security and such and such, which we could help. Uh, so we thought it's a good uh, kind of marriage. And after acquiring um, CoinCheck, what kind of effort did you guys make to make CoinCheck come back again and to build the trust with the customers again? Uh, I think, uh, generally speaking, uh, in the cyber area, offense technology has become much stronger or bigger than defense technology, right? So there's a gap between offense and defense. So we have to make sure that uh, we use the, the best defense technologies and experiences. Offense doesn't come to those uh, best car tire. Mm. They tend to go to low end, mm. right? Of course, we have to talk to the global players you know, we can't realize that just dealing with the Japanese uh, players. So we, we talk to global mm -hmm. players and, and uh, working hard every day. Why did you decide to go into crypto space? What kind of opportunity did you see in this space? It's a center of uh, new technologies. It's quite uh, exciting. I started my career uh, in derivatives in late 1980s. And the situation in crypto today is very similar to derivatives in 1980s. Okay, it's a uh, new technology, new thesis, new idea. Uh, only few people understood. Regulators didn't like it. Okay. Um, no way to account. That's not, you know, the accounting method is very immature at that time. And there are you know, the greedy guys and the most uh, you know, the, the trader uh, or investor who could take a biggest risk. Smart guys, bad guys, regulators, uh, academias, accountants, everybody came into derivatives at that time. So there's a kind of fusion of those resources and out of that fusion, there are many innovation mm. took place. Okay. It's not only for derivatives product, but also for the simulation technology and the computer science, regulation, accounting, many places innovation happened. And then there were those who were there benefited from those innovations. So I thought we should be there. We should be principally there if the first breakout of the Bitcoin price in 2013 gave the general public an opportunity to get to know Bitcoin, it was the sudden increased interest in the technology behind Bitcoin in 2017 
that truly brought about an overall rise in the price of cryptocurrencies, thus becoming a new type of financial phenomenon. Former Goldman Sachs partner Michael Novogratz, a veteran of the traditional financial world, was convinced that Wall Street's next hot topic would be cryptocurrency. He made a high-profile comeback in the game and founded a full-service cryptocurrency merchant bank, Galaxy Digital. Hi, Mike. I'm Bianca. So Mike. nice to meet you. Nice to see you. Well, great. Thank you. I put a shirt on just for you. <laughs> Lovely shirt. You made a lot of money from, yeah. right, investing in crypto. When you buy something at, you know, $100 in Bitcoin and it goes to 20000 you don't have to be that smart to make a lot of money. And so part of it was buying at good levels. I bought Ethereum at a dollar. I bought Bitcoin at $100. Uh, and then it was using the same skills that I had developed over 25 years on Wall Street as a trader. To know when things got to crazy prices, I would sell. And when they would sell back off, I would buy. What's your return like? A lot. Yeah. A lot. A lot. I actually made a lot of money in my initial stake was, yeah, it's probably 100x. And during an interview or speech, you mentioned Bitcoin will be the biggest bubble ever. Why did you jump in? You can make lots of money by riding bubbles, uh, right? If you, if you had thought about being a technology investor in 1994, by late 1999, you'd made a fortune. To understand bubbles, bubbles happen around things that fundamentally change how we live our lives, right? The internet bubble was all about what the promise of the internet was, and oh my goodness, the internet delivered on that promise, right? Everything about life is different because of the internet. The railroad bubble, you know, the railroads changed the way we lived our lives. And so, bubbles happen around stories that are easily told, and around technologies that really are, you know, uh, earth-changing. And I think blockchain will be that. So last year, you decided to put all your in, uh, crypto investment into Galaxy Digital. I want to be the space's first really uh, strong and powerful merchant bank. So we have a direct investment business that goes from venture to, to credit lending. And we're already doing some advisory, and we raise capital for companies. And the final one is asset management. We're going to manage other people's money. Are you afraid of the, um, the traditional big financial institutions to come in, into yeah. the space? Listen, what the space needs is institutional participation, and it's coming. There was yeah. an article in the paper today that talked about Goldman getting, or at least researching, being in custody. I do think we have a couple year head start be between, before the Jeffreys and you know, at first, and then the Goldmans and Merrill Lynch's second, you know, come into the space. From being limited to a group of geeks in the beginning, to attracting talents from many industries, especially finance and technology, the blockchain circle has been evolving all the time. Blockchain, from an ingenious innovation in technology, to a tool of investment and even speculation, and then to application development. What do these blockchain people pursue? Is it wealth, some kind of big breakthrough, or what else? We want to make the first IPO in the world's first IPO in the world. Why um, the risk of putting the exchange in Digital X is something I don't think Digital X shareholders will appreciate is uh, if um, a hack happens. 在讨论完公司的业务模型之后，我们觉得就挖矿这件事情是最容易获得主流机构认可的。自从有了矿机芯片公司，有了比较大规模的就矿工就挖矿这件事情，就变成了一个一个商业行为了。但是应该说这个挖矿这件事情还是有有有。有呃，利润对吧？有有增长，那有没有帮助你做 IPO 这件事儿呢？监管机构和证交所还是认为这个商业模式风险太高。我印象当中可能可能数不清了吧，两三年的时间，想想就不停的交材料，再打回来交材料，再打回来，经常有希望，然后又经常极度极度失望。为什么这件就是 IPO 这件事情这么执着？我觉得当时就是怄了一股气，就想证明，因为有太多人说我们在做，对我骗子是做传销。
。那我想证明的就是，那我们如果做的这件事情能够被主流监管机构所认可的话，那那我们应该可以证明给所有人看，这个行业是一个非常正常的行业。就其实这也是个非常渺小的想法吧。Hello. So let's meet Jenny. Hi, Jenny. Nice to meet you, Jenny. Alan, nice to meet you. You 刚才已经听他说你很多故事了。肯定都是不好的，就是。你怎么聊？聊一聊，聊一聊，聊一聊。行行行，哦，这个更更有意思。这个 2013, and also running a meetup events since then. And then that's how we met Ryan. Ryan came to our meetup, and then in which year? In early 2014. Okay. Yeah, and then uh, I ran jump on board. Says let's let's do something big. That's how we met each other. Yeah. The Martian's dream was to be the first listed Bitcoin company. It might seem astonishing a few years ago. Fortunately, he met his partners Sam and Alan in Australia. At that time, these two had already earned a reputation in the Australian blockchain world by doing arbitrage business. Arbitrage is all about um, taking market inefficiencies uh, that um, exist across multiple exchanges uh, and then buying and selling at the same time, low and high. Uh, we have been um, considerably successful um, when in 2013 uh, making around about 40% uh, return monthly on our investment. Uh, That's a lot of money. <laughs> uh, yeah. So why do you need someone else to help you? Ryan said, hey, look, um, mm -hmm. there's a great opportunity. It's called Bitcoin mining. And back then, because there were very few competitors in this space, yeah. we did the maths and it turns out to be quite profitable. So uh, that's how us three got into bed together. Mm -hmm. uh, not literally. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, Mars, you know, everyone in China knows him, very, very famous. Sam is one of the early, earliest uh, organizer in, mm. in Australia. Wow. So, very influential in Australia. At the time, I think we are like a, a strong, strong link together and want to make our business even larger. We thought we can create world first Bitcoin related company to do a successful IPO. So that's how I feel. <laughs> 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 That was our original office. So this, this was where the international BTCC company was. How so big was the team? It was about over 100 people. Just 100, 120 people. And yeah. You know, we're not a bank. We don't have a banking license. But if we want to do it, we probably need to get a banking license. But yet, the banking commission, they won't give us a banking license. So it's, it's this very awkward situation where we're trying to do it the right way. We're asking what the right way is, but they won't teach us how, nor, they will, nor will they authorize us to do it, right? Whether it is the Martian's IPO dream or BTC China's persistence in applying for a banking license, a large number of blockchain practitioners' efforts were not simply for commercial gain. Many of them were expecting one thing to happen, that is, getting accepted by the mainstream. Well, I said in the press conference in April that CoinCheck would target to the IPO because in the context of that uh, I thought that CoinCheck or crypto exchanges are going to be put the more like a bank type of regulation. So it's like a bank, yeah. bank with a safe, big safe, right? Um, so that uh, it is naturally it is natural to think that uh, crypto exchanges are going to receive more like a bank type of uh, capital requirement or regulations. And if that is the case, it is better for someone like CoinCheck uh, to have access to public capital market mm -hmm. to always uh, be able to strengthen the capital base. So in that context, I said, you know, uh, uh, the CoinCheck would Think about uh, doing IPO. You know, money laundering. Like when they deal with real money, with, with, with uh, fiat money, government money, uh, there are a lot of rules. You know, at one point, we, BTC China, had the world's highest uh, trading volume. That was in the, in the, in the end of 2013. You know? um, 
and then shortly after Mt. Gox closed down. And plus we realized later on, years later, that it turns out trading volumes can be actually fabricated because it's just a company telling what the trading volume is. So there's no, uh, there's no hard way to prove it one way or the other. And then there's a lot of market makers you could, you could trade with yourself, left hand, right hand. Mm-hmm。可能就是很单纯的觉得我们是对的 I think all regulators, the US regulators, the Korean, the Japanese, Chinese, the crypto market just jumped up on them. They didn't see it coming. They didn't see it coming because regulators don't come from gra- grassroots. They come from institutions. And so they were behind the curve. They were doing what regulators are supposed to be doing. It's like, can I understand the space? Can I make sure I'm protecting the investor that comes into it? And I think there was a lot of catch up to do. Yeah. Everywhere. You mean for the regulators? For the regulators in general. It's that's why the why like a lot of them said, stop. Let us catch up and then we'll let you go again. Or they said slow. You know. Uh, and they're getting there now. I think in almost every country we look at, the regulators are running up the learning curve. And I think it's a good thing for the system. After many twists and turns, Galaxy Digital finally began trading on the Toronto Stock Exchange on August 1st, 2018. Will the Martian and BTC China stories have a happy ending as well? Was that easy to get listed in Australia? Regulators were not ready at the time. Uh, we were able to build the relationship necessary to have them understand the ecosystem properly. We have to thank our lawyers and um, mm-hmm. also our supporters in um, participating in that journey. What we did is, it, it wasn't a case, but it was discussions with ASIC to say, that uh, bitcoins are a real uh, commodity, uh, that uh, blockchain mining was a real business. You we had to do in order to get them to uh, not hold up our prospectus as part of the IPO and we eventually achieved that. We were the first to go to ASIC and say this is what we want to do. So in some respects we were the trailblazers there. So that was a very good process to go through and where it got us to was it resolved 99% of the issues through that dialogue. Um, As it turned out um, the stumbling block they had in terms of demonstrating the value of these assets was something that they effectively overcame uh, as effectively six months after the incident, with the increase in prices, they overcame that concern. Did you spend a lot of time with regulators? We talked to regulators in 2013, yeah. you know, in the summer, in the fall of 2013. We spoke with them in 2014, 15, yeah. and then much more in 2017. There was a big push for regulation in early 2017, January. We had lots of conversations with regulators, January, February, March. And then at one point we thought we were going to get the license. We really thought we were. It was, we were this close to getting the license for operating a Bitcoin uh, trading platform in China. Very, very close. Yeah. Up through July, August, we thought we were this close to getting an exchange license, a trading platform license. And, we, and when we think that, we really, we really had confirmation from the regulators and so on. We thought we were very close. They gave us confirmation. In 2017, more and more people started to realize the value of Bitcoin. Apart from startups, many large companies also started to explore the possibilities of blockchain applications. Even many governments have started blockchain tests. The mainstream gradually began to embrace this technology behind Bitcoin. However, good times didn't last long. 
Some governments soon put forward strict regulations to deal with the huge wealth bubble created alongside cryptocurrencies. It wasn't until September that all of a sudden it's a 180 degree turn. Not only are we not getting a license, we're going to be asked to shut down. It was... I met with them on September 12th. Uh, I went in with my colleagues and we met with them. And uh, they said, that's the plan. That's when it was a shock. It's like, what? Are, is this serious? And they, they say, this is serious. This is real. Unless we want to face the consequences, which we didn't want to face any criminal consequences of that. So, um, so by, by the way, they, they did bring in the police and the, and the Kong Anju and all that. So, uh, so they, they really, they were serious. They were serious that if you don't, you know, do the right thing. It's not about following the rule. They don't, if we don't do the right thing. It wasn't a complete surprise because since the very early days of 2013, we planned for it. We knew one day we could be kicked out, that we could be shut down. That was a, a, a sad moment, not only for BTC China, but also for the, the whole exchanges industry, right? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. It was, it was a small setback.从去年开始吧，我逐渐的修正了自己的想法，因为我觉得如果我们这个行业区块链行业就是为了颠覆现有的整个金融系统的话，那我觉得主流金融机构认不认可我们根本就不重要，就我们自己能够认可自己，那这
Every day there's about 10 to 20 new exchanges launching. Wow. Uh, and going live, uh, some of them going live, and um, has been like that for the last five years, I think. Every day? Yeah, actually, um, so uh, many people told me, hey, look, CZ, what are you doing, right? There's like, this is an old concept. Um, there's like thousands, if not tens of thousands of exchanges around, um, and some of them are really big. Um, some of them have very proven business models, etc. Um, so you're not going to be able to compete. Like, well, why, why compete in this place? Um, but I, I told them, look, this is the only thing I know how to do. I know we have a superior product. I know we have a very strong team, even though quite small. What do you think about these crazy growth? We did grow very quickly, but the comparison to Deutsche Bank is not really fair to them. Some large companies will have a negative profit quarter. And yeah, I mean, if you compare if you compare any company to a negative negative pro, uh, a, a profit a quarter where they have some some company have a loss, yes, any startup are more profitable than them. Um, but I think yes, uh, in general, the kind of revenues we're generating and the kind of profits we're generating are probably comparable to companies almost a hundred times or a thousand times our size. Um, so we've grown very very quickly. I think Binance probably is the first company that grown so quickly internationally from the very beginning. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning, because we don't accept fiat. So sure. most people saw that as a limitation. We mm -hmm. only accept blockchain deposits and withdrawals, only crypto assets, right? That is that the first exchange only accepts? No, 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 that's, that's, that's a few other before. I see. And they were not small either, but they had a, they had a more localized uh, uh, culture. So they only have English interfaces, they only mm -hmm. have a web platform. They're, they're based in, uh, actually both of them were based in Amer uh, USA. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of focused on a big um, USA market. So we want to service everywhere else in the world. And we want to service the uh, languages that people don't, uh, well, a lot of businesses haven't thought about or don't care mm -hmm. about. Mm -hmm. So we supported like uh, uh, Koreans, Japanese, um, even Russian, uh, and even like uh, Turkish. So yeah. when we first started, I, I think within a month, we had users from 180 countries. Seizing the opportunity in the international market with a crypto to crypto strategy, Binance grew vigorously despite the catastrophe caused by the Chinese ban. It has also brought a new wave of inspiration to the exchange industry. However, ignoring regulatory restrictions does not guarantee its long-lasting vitality. Lacking innovation is one part. But more importantly, the fact that they remain centralized in the wave of decentralization might be the real issue that hobbles the industry's future development. 其实交易所现在大部分还是一个中心化的，它其实不是一个很，就是说符合区块链理念的这么一个行业。你怎么看这么一个生态？首先，你说交易所是中心化的，那很简单，因为这个市场需要快速的交易的机制啊。那么，你目前产业界没有发展出更好的技术，这种中心化的。这个撮合的交易所是最快的，能够让给数字资产定价的系统啊，所以这个系统还是一样，虽然它有问题，但是它是最不坏的、最不邪恶的这个系统。那另外关于这个中心化和去中心化的问题啊，这个目前的这个这个交易所的系统，大部分它的是交易是中心化的，那么它的资产的清算是在区块链上的，比如说比特币和以太坊的清算是在区块链上的。啊，那么交易能否做到区块链上？我的我的观点是未来是可以的，但是呢，它还需要这个这个技术的不断发展。比如说，即使我相信我们放眼未来的十年和二十年，中心化的交易所仍然会存在，因为世界上在很多国家，那么把比特币定义成一种合法的资产，它能够对法币、对美元、对欧元进行和对日元、韩元都可以进行合法的交易。日元和韩元目前是非链上的。没有链上的日元跟韩元的，所以数字资产对法币的交易在很长一段时间内仍然会以中心化交易所的形态来存在，啊，那么至于说币币交易，那么随着区块链技术啊越来越强大，可能这种 decentralized 的交易所能够取代很多目前中心化交易所的市场，啊，但这个市场还会有衍生品，还会有更很多更多的衍生品，可能也也还需要以中心化这个交易所的形态存在。Exchanges provide market liquidity for retail investors. However, the volume of single transactions is still relatively small. For large-scale transactions, asset platforms that provide OTC trading and management services for professional traders have emerged in the market. Many times, the demand for OTC trading has even surpassed that of exchanges. 
one of the world's leading cryptocurrency startups, Circle, has also launched a global OTC crypto desk Circle trade, which now moves over $2 billion each month. Ricky Lee, a senior commodity trading analyst, also took advantage of this opportunity. In May 2018, he founded Autonomy, a platform dedicated to trading and asset management for the crypto secondary market. The interesting thing about crypto is because crypto can be traded on any number of exchanges, you can think about the OTC desk as sort of like a aggregator, like a kayak or a Goda type of thing. So institutions that want to have access to liquidity can now go to a one-touch OTC desk who can then fulfill the orders across a number of exchanges and other liquidity sources. And that's why OTC markets in crypto tend to be larger than uh, people expect because of this uh, customers not wanting to have custodian risk, uh, having funds on exchanges. They also don't necessarily want to be on uh, every exchange and having the hassle of doing that integration. Uh, it's just a lot more fragmented in, the, in this industry. The OTC market is always at least five times or ten times bigger than the actual market trading on exchanges. In the crypto market, nobody knows for sure how much volume is on the OTC yeah. side, but we know for sure how much volume on the on the exchange side, right? Based on our rough estimates, it's pretty much ten times. Ten times. Ten times more and more bigger than the ones exchange on exchanges. While the crypto secondary market is booming, the market for cryptocurrency derivatives with higher margins is also expanding. The derivatives have already been in compliance with the rules of the market for some time, drawing in more people from the traditional financial industry. According to data released by CME Group in October 2018, despite the current downturn in cryptocurrency spot trading, Bitcoin futures are growing continuously in both CME Group's daily average trading volume and open interest. If we look at cryptocurrencies, you know, the fundamental market development is to get liquidity and to be able to exchange value um, and to be able to do commerce, but you need more. So um, futures contracts and derivatives is a, uh, a very uh, both highly profitable um, enterprise within financial services, but it's it's key to market development. Um, it was that next step in the evolution of cryptocurrency, the crypto economy, and everything from supply chain to uh, every business and actually every person has contracts all around them. Uh, so it's a very, very broad space. If you look at what the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and Chicago Board Ops Exchange are both doing, is they are, they've created derivatives based on the underlying price of virtual currencies. I think that's a significant step in taking those as a serious asset class. They think there's a real potential market here, and it's a regulated market. They're taking it seriously. Facing the growing appeal of the market, traditional financial giants J.P. Morgan Chase, Northern Trust, Goldman Sachs, and several other banks are switching battlefields, setting their sights on developing cryptocurrency hosting services for institutional investors. It has been reported that 2019 is expected to witness a $20 billion institutional funds flow. The Wall Street giants are running into the arena. However, this brand new crypto market still looks a lot like the Wild West. Crypto is like lacking of infrastructure, lack of pretty much everything. In terms of secondary market, it's either exchanges facilities and the professional trading services, which like what we do and also the level of sophistication of the traders in the market are pretty much all at a very, very in, you know, nascent stage compared to the traditional financial market. Institutions, you know, with, with, with like, like the, those guys' size, they will never be able to, they will never actually be able to trade themselves or, or, or basically go on the market and build the infrastructure through themselves. They rely, unlike stock market and commodities market, right? they rely on professional trading firms to help them out to either enter or exit positions. How far do you think uh, are we away from these big guys to come in? Mm -hmm. We hear some rumors like you know, other banks like Goldman and Morgan Stanley or you know, um, Merrill Lynch, those guys are thinking about it, offering structured product based on the CME features, right? That's like a baby steps towards trading spot market on the offshore crypto exchanges, right? I would say still a year away, at least a year away. And, and that's basically uh, our edge. If they're still a year away, then that means we have a year of time to grow, right?
The CFTC, which is the Commodities Futures Trading Commission, which regulates um, derivatives markets, so swaps and futures and other derivative financial products based on underlying commodities, they came out in, I think, 2015 mm -hmm. and classified Bitcoin as a commodity. And then the anti-money laundering regulators, FinCEN, classified Bitcoin as a virtual currency. And then the SEC has thus far said that Bitcoin doesn't seem necessarily like a security, but they could come out and say that it's a security at some point. It can be a property, a commodity, a virtual currency, all at the same time without there being conflict. Besides introducing a new asset class of cryptocurrencies, Digitization seems to have brought about new opportunities for the entire traditional financial market as well. A lot of people have started to tokenize existing financial assets, and the STO, or Security Token Offering, is becoming increasingly popular. In August 2018, T0, a blockchain subsidiary of Overstock, one of the top 10 online retailers in the U.S., announced the successful completion of its preferred security token offering that is fully compliant with U.S. laws and regulations. More than 1,000 investors worldwide piled in, raising $134 million. The industry is waiting to see if the rise of security tokens will instigate the next round of development in the crypto financial market. Over four years ago, we became the large comp first company over a million dollars to accept Bitcoin. And we created T0 to be basically the intersection of blockchain and Wall Street. I think we're ahead of everybody in the world on creating a blockchain capital market. What do you think about the, the regulation risk? I actually think it's needed and it should be regulated. The more the SEC focuses on that stuff, yeah. the more people have to do security tokens. Well, what we have been building is security tokens. We did the world's first private blockchain security a bond. We did the world's first public blockchain security. It's OSTK.P, it's trading today. I think you're gonna see securities tokens starting in the next few months. There's industries that wanna tap capital markets in new, new ways. There are new ideas of what can be securitized. The idea of tokenizing things opened up the imagination. I could see in the biotech space having really cool security tokens. Definitely it's coming to the real estate space. Bitcoin's been around for, for what, nine to 10 years now. In a way, you could say it's to the test of time, but the core concepts of, of tokenization and decentralization and everything we're learning from those, I think will continue to uh, define and evolve our services. Take it away and, and let's keep it again, please. Let's make it interactive. So tech part team, if there's any questions, um, you know, don't hesitate to interrupt. Absolutely. So maybe for the benefit of the cameras, this is a, a capstone um, project at Columbia University School of International and Public Affairs. We've been tasked to uh, review the blockchain space for tech par group. Um, and that's what we've been doing for the past semester. So we already gave it Lumber Capital um, is where I've been for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So um, this is my second year that I've been teaching at Columbia University. This semester teaching a class uh, which we just finished this morning on, on blockchain and cryptocurrency. So is this the very first blockchain course in Columbia? You know, I don't know actually if it's yeah. the first course. Um, I will say that the administration was very enthusiastic when um, we discussed and then they approached me to teach yeah. a course on blockchain. So there's tremendous demand um, from what I'm hearing uh, across the university. And I think that's true on a much larger scale, not just Columbia University. And in fact, I know a few of the capstones that started out not discussing or related to blockchain evolved and they pivoted into something blockchain related. It's clear to me that blockchain is real, meaningful, and going to have impact for decades across a variety of verticals. And so for the students that are going out into the world, they have to pay attention to this. And so they really have an edge. They're really talented, you know, young, bright um, you know, students. And they're thinking, where do they want to go with their careers over the next 20, 30 years? According to U.S. hiring site Glassdoor's research, in 2018, the demand for blockchain-related jobs increased by 300% as compared to the previous year. 
New York City, San Francisco, and San Jose accounted for the most number of openings in the technology. Statistics from Upwork shows that demand for freelancers with a blockchain asset grew by 3,500% this year as compared to last year. I studied engineering uh, as an undergraduate, and then I worked in financial technology for many years in Mexico City, actually. What attracted you to take that course? Well, I was working in the space, uh, so it was obviously a good fit. I uh, learned a lot over the semester, so we did a lot of uh, research on all the various projects that are trying to look at uh, applications of these technologies. Uh, obviously, there's a wide, wide array of them. Um, but there's also a lot of challenges still. So, you know, we'll see where this all goes. Uh, it's all very auspicious, but it's still uncertain. So what's the true significance um, of blockchain, in yeah. your opinion? I study here at the School of International and Public Affairs, uh, which I think is actually more fitting for uh, this space because it really is more question of governance and society. Uh, how does a group of strangers uh, cooperate, really, is uh, kind of a fundamental question that a society has to grapple with. So uh, I'm glad the education I got here at the School of International Affairs has helped me to kind of understand some of these complex and multifaceted issues. Talking from uh, educational point of view. So yeah. what kind of talents do we need for blockchain? So I think having the combination of a technology background and understanding is fantastic. Combining that maybe with business acumen and understanding to where there's a business opportunity, what is the business model, how can we monetize this uh, application, that combination is fantastic. Blockchain的这些投资啊，其实跟澳大利亚关系很大。那时候什么东西想到，就是要到澳大利亚来，就是这样发展。呃，因为在一一年的时候，我爱人来澳大利亚墨尔本这边来读书，所以说，嗯，
Their fate and the prospects of the blockchain industry are still unknown. I felt it was the right decision at the time. Yeah. I still think it was the right decision. I think in hindsight, if I knew that was like the, the high price, I might not have sold, which is ironic because I know that because that was a high price, I would get a lot of um, hate for it for, because people would feel like I sold out at the high price. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping the price would just keep going up so that at least people wouldn't like, think too much about me selling. Do you have any moment like you feel a little kind of regret of doing that? So it actually felt good after I sold it because it was, it was kind of weighing, weighing on me at the time. I felt like I didn't really need to hold Litecoin for me to be still passionate about making Litecoin successful. Mm -hmm. Because I created Litecoin, it's kind of like my legacy. So money wasn't really a driving uh, factor mm -hmm. for me. Okay. So I decided to kind of remove myself from from investment in Litecoin. I still use it. I still have a little bit where I use it for payments, and, but I don't, I'm not invested in the in the price of Litecoin. So to speak. Either Shanghai your home. Yeah, yeah, Shanghai is my yeah. home now. Mm. Mm. 建立当中懂得如何去冬眠的动物，我始终是还是给自己，呃，退休的这种可能性，或者说一个梦想。但是呢，呃，坦率来讲，可能始终都还是会被这种工作和创造的激情去牵引。This is a new field we're making a big bet that in the future we're going to make a fortune. Sometimes the negative things turn out to be positive things. We always want to disrupt ourselves, and we always want, we always embrace new technology innovation. Actually, I'm very, very happy that we were the world's longest running Bitcoin exchange, running for, I think, um, over seven years, uh, so over six years, six and a half years almost. In the next few years, we're going to see a lot of the applications that already exist really start to kind of become more mature and scale up, and uh, gr some of them uh, grow to start reaching large numbers of users. I think that being able to engage the, the larger kind of cryptographic and crypto communities um, will be really helpful to us in the future. And, and the idea of creating these public goods that can both create business, but also serve humanity yeah. is a relatively new idea, maybe in the last 50 years. Well, the future is not something to be predicted, it's something to be achieved. In
I should not be licking at you. I should be licking at you. Okay. I'm rolling. Next. 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 Hi. Next. 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 Okay. Next. Next. Okay. <laughs>